that through there. And John chapter 16. So actually, John chapter 14, 15, and 16, if you want to know a good passage to see uh, some things about the Holy Ghost or a lot of information about the Holy Ghost, um, these three chapters are great chapters. So you have uh, chapter 14 actually is a great chapter just dealing with the Trinity itself. So if you want to see the details of the hierarchy of the Trinity, chapter 14 is a great chapter there. But chapter 16 is dealing a lot with the Holy Ghost, uh, you know, what the ministry of the Holy Ghost is and all that. So we already hit on the Father. So we, you know, God the Father. Then we had God the Son. And now we're getting into God the Holy Spirit. So obviously we know that we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. You had the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But like I did in the, the earlier sermons, I want to show you, uh, you know, some places where it talks about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Now, honestly, the Spirit of God is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament. So time would fail me to go to all the places that it mentions it. But go to Genesis 1, and I just want to show you some places here. But actually, the, the term Holy Spirit isn't used that often. Actually, in the entire Bible, it's not used that often, like the term Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost is used a lot, but it's only used in the New Testament. Now, Spirit and Ghost are the same thing. Okay, so anybody that tells you that the Ghost or the Spirit are two different things, um, they're just synonyms. Okay, so... Uh, ghost comes from a Germanic language, you know, it comes from German, and spirit comes from Latin. And our language is a very Germanic language, but it also comes from, and stems from Latin. So that means that, you know, when Jesus said, I, into thine hands I commit my spirit, and then he gave up the ghost, okay? So uh, it, it's just the same word. It's just obviously more poetic to, to not use the same word all the way through and sometimes use some synonyms there. So anyway, all that to say is that Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, um, same thing. But we see here in Genesis 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And you can really see the, you know, the Trinity here. Obviously the Word of God is you know, being spoken, and the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then you have uh, the Spirit of God moving upon the water. So it's just explicitly showing you that the Spirit of God was there as well, right? So usually you know the Father, the Son's there, the Father, the Word, but the Spirit of God was there moving upon the waters and working in the creation, okay? So uh, we see that at the very beginning there, and obviously let us make man in our image after our likeness. We definitely see the Trinity there. Uh, Psalm 51, go to Psalm 51, and just to show you the Holy Spirit mentioned. And so I just want to show you some Old Testament uh, mentions of the Holy Spirit. Now, when, you, when you're dealing from the Old Testament, New Testament, or even pre-Old Testament to Old Testament to New Testament, the big thing with the Holy Ghost is the fact that the Holy Ghost did not indwell us. It did not live we weren't the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? And that's something that the New Testament really uh, harps on. And the fact the difference of the Holy Ghost being upon you or the Holy Ghost being with you and the Holy Ghost being in you, okay? Um, and so being filled with the Spirit is different than the, the Holy Ghost living inside of you, okay? Or dwelling in you, okay? Um, but in, in Psalm 51, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now this is David speaking here, and a lot of people say, well, let's see, he lost his salvation here, <laughs> right? But what you have to understand is the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Ghost living inside of them, but they had you know, the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit, and to have the Spirit of God upon them, and the Spirit of God left Saul, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't saved or he lost his salvation, right? It just means that, obviously, you know, the Spirit of God wasn't coming upon him. He wasn't walking, you know, in the new man. And notice what it says in verse 12. It says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and upon me with thy, uh, and, and uphold me with thy free spirit. So he didn't say restore unto me salvation. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. 
So there's a difference between that and losing your salvation or like the Holy Ghost basically meaning like you've lost your salvation or he's saying, don't make me lose my salvation. That's not what it's saying here. Um, but the Holy Spirit was back then, okay? And I could show you other places in the New Testament where it's talking about uh, well spake the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David. So obviously the Holy Ghost was there speaking by the mouth of David um, and all that's true, okay? So, um, and I have other verses I could show you in the Old Testament, but I don't want to belabor that point about, uh, you know, the mention of the Holy Spirit. Honestly, that's the one where it's like very clear, right? I don't think anybody denies that the Spirit of God was in the Old Testament uh, doing things, okay? Now, go to John 14, John 14, and we're really going to be parked in John 14, 15, and 16 uh, to kind of see some attributes of the Holy Ghost. But the first thing to notice about the Holy Ghost is that he is a, his own person, okay? The Holy Ghost is not just this apparition or this attribute uh, of God, okay? The Holy Spirit is his own person, okay? So in John 14 and verse 15, Someone needs to tell those in the mother baby room to maybe <laughs> calm it down back there. I can hear it through the walls. So John 14 and verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it seeth him not, or because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So notice here that we have the he, okay? It's not saying it or, you know, like this entity of some sort, right? Now, sometimes it will use the term it, but sometimes it uses the term it when it's talking about like a baby, okay? So just because it says it or that or which, uh, you know, sometimes that's referred to as a person, you know, uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, you know? It's not meaning that he's not a who, but sometimes... Uh, that I forget the way they the imperfect uh, pronoun or whatever they call that when you use that or which when you're dealing with a person. Okay, um, but that being said, is notice that it says here in verse 16 that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. So the Comforter is the Spirit of Truth. Okay, or the Holy Ghost that we're going to see later on. It says, "Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not." Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So at the time that this is being written, or when Jesus is saying this, this is before he's glorified. Okay? So before he was glorified and he rose from the dead, the Holy Ghost was with them. right? He dwelleth with them, but it says shall be in you. Okay? So the dwelling in you is something that happened you know, after his resurrection. And remember, he breathed on uh, his disciples and says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And this isn't a whole sermon about the difference between having the, the Holy Ghost living in you or dwelling in you and, and the Holy Ghost coming upon you or being filled with the Spirit, but those are two different things. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost coming upon you, and the Holy Ghost being filled with the Holy Ghost, that's something different, okay, than him living in you or abiding with you forever, okay? There's going to be an important point I want to get to with that, but first of all, I want you to see that he's his own person, right? So you have God the Father, he's a he, right, his own person. God the Son, he, his own person. And God the Holy Ghost, you know, or the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Truth, or the Comforter, you know, all these different names that he has, is he, okay? It's a person. It's not just this attribute. And I think sometimes that's where, I've never heard anybody say the Spirit of God is not God, okay? So we're not usually having to defend the deity of the Holy Ghost, right? But I think sometimes people don't realize that it's not just the power of God. Does that make sense? It's not just like his attributes. And I think sometimes that's what people get when it's like his spirit. It's kind of like his personality or, you know, something like that. No, this is the person, the Holy Ghost. Okay. And what we're going to see is that the Holy Ghost has pretty much the same hierarchy as the, the son does to the father or the father does to the son, the son does to the Holy Ghost. If that makes sense. So meaning that we saw where the Son does always those things which please the Father. He speaks the words of the Father. He comes in his Father's name, right? And he, he came down not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him, which is the will of the Father. And so we're going to see those same things dealing with the Holy Ghost to the Son. 
And so it's very interesting to see that. In verse 25, so John 14 and verse 25, like I said, John 14 really shows you this with the Father and the Son as well. Um, so John 14, if you want to see the hierarchy of the, the Holy Ghost, or I mean of the, of the Trinity, that is the chapter to go to. In verse 25 there it says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Sound familiar? It says, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So remember that Jesus said, I, I came not in my own name. I came in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. So Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, and I do the works in my Father's name. And what's the Holy Ghost doing? The Father sending the Holy Ghost in whose name? Jesus' name. Interesting, isn't it? Especially when you think about this. You ever see the place where it says the Spirit of Christ? That's the Holy Spirit, right? Because you think, well, is that like, the, you know, like Jesus' spirit as far as like his, you know, soul spirit, you know, whatever, his attributes? No, it's the Spirit of God. And that's why sometimes you'll see in, in Romans chapter 8, for example, it talks about the Spirit of God being in you. It says, if the Spirit of God not be in you, you're none of his, right? But it says, if the Spirit of Christ be in you, Right? And he uses those terms synonymously as far as the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ. Well, he's coming in the name of Jesus. Right? Just as much as Jesus came in the name of the Father. So that same type of uh, hierarchy of the Son to the Holy Ghost happens with the Father to the, to the Son. And it's very interesting how consistent it is. And also you see here that he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And Jesus is talking. And we'll get further into that because it's going to be a little more uh, explained at a little more detail. But we also see here that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father, right? So Jesus and the Holy Ghost are coming from the same place, okay? They're God. <laughs> so um, it, in, 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 uh, go to John, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26. I feel like sometimes, I mean, obviously the Bible talks about the Father and the Son a lot in the, in the New Testament, but the Spirit's mentioned a lot. But I think sometimes there's, a, there's this mystique or mis mystery around the Holy Ghost as far as uh, what his job is, uh, you know, his relationship. And really, the relationship of the Holy Ghost to the Father and Son is, is, is pretty standard. You know, as far as if you're looking at Father, Son, Holy Ghost, everything that applies from the Father to the Son applies from the Son to the Holy Ghost. You know, that's what we see here in the scriptures, okay? And they're all three, their own person, right? Three persons, one God, and the Holy Ghost is always going to do those things that please the Son, and the Son's going to always do those things that please the Father, and that God may be all in all. You know, it, it just really shows you the perfect unity, right? Because we use that term Trinity is three united into one, that perfect unity of the Godhead. And, uh, you know, obviously God's unique, but it's just uh, awesome to see that. Now, in verse 26 here, it says, But when the Comforter is come, when I, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Okay, so we see that the Spirit of truth is proceeding from the Father, right? And so it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus proceeded from the Father, came forth from the Father. He's the only begotten Son of God. The Spirit is not a Son, right? He's not the Son of God. And it would have to be that way. If you were going to say, like, well, just proceeding forth from the Father meant that you're a child of God, right? But see, Jesus was the Son of God from eternity past, and He's the only one that came forth. He's the only Son of God that came forth from the Father, right? But... You could say that about the Holy Spirit. He's the only Holy Spirit that came forth from the Father, right? So it's just unique, right? Obviously, there's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one Son of God. There's always, obviously, only one Father, okay? So, but going on from that, go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. So, we see that the Holy Ghost, he's proceeding forth from the Father. He's 
he's sending the Spirit in Jesus' name, and he's his own person, right? And up to this point, he would only be uh, dwelling with you. He wasn't in you, right? Obviously, in our day and age, right, obviously in the New Testament, when Jesus rose from the dead, he uh, gave us the comforter. And that's what the big deal, you know, you say, what's this big deal about this comforter coming? You know, why is Jesus making this big deal, right? The comforter is going to come, and if I don't leave, that he won't come. The big deal is the fact that the comforter is going to dwell in you and dwell in you forever, okay? And I think sometimes, you know, when you, when you look at this too, when you look at the Revelation and you see the new heaven, new earth, and you wonder, okay, well, where's the Holy Ghost? Well, I believe he's going to be dwelling in each and every one of us forever, okay? It doesn't sh say that we're going to see him necessarily, okay? It says we're going to see the Father's face, and obviously we're going to see the Son, but it doesn't say, and, and again, we're talking about things that we may not know, so I'm not saying we won't see the Holy Ghost, right, when we're in that spiritual uh, body and all that stuff that's going on. Who knows, <laughs> you know, but I'm just telling you what we see in Scripture, but I know this, that he's going to be dwelling in us and abiding with us forever, okay? That much is true, okay? That's not just till you die, okay? This is forever. We'll be, you know, the Holy Ghost will be dwelling in us, okay? And so, but in John chapter 16 and verse 7 here, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, notice this, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So we see what's the job of the Holy Ghost in the world. Now, obviously we know what's the, what's the point of his coming. The coming is talking about him abiding in us, uh, you know, receiving the Holy Ghost that he's going to dwell in us. He's not just going to be dwelling with us, he's going to dwell in us, okay? That's the, the importance of the coming. But also when he comes into the world, as far as this in the New Testament, it says he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, this is a great three-point outline. If you ever want to preach a sermon about the Holy Ghost, you know, the three points of his ministry, right? And it just even explains it here, verse 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Okay? So, I believe the Holy Ghost is working in the world. And notice that he's, who's he reproving? Just, you know, save people, his children, or the world, Okay? So I believe what you're dealing with here are unsafe people. You know, you're dealing with the world. What's the Holy Ghost doing in the world? What's his, his ministry in the world, if you will? He's reproving the world of sin. He's also reproving the world of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Okay? And it says in verse 11, of judge, and he reproved the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Okay, so just one verse to kind of show you what the Holy Ghost would be doing in the world. Uh, go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Because I do believe the Holy Ghost has a job when it comes to uh, the work and the ministry in the world. Because you think about God is the, is the husbandry, we are his, his, his laborers, right? And obviously we're abiding in the vine and the fathers, the husbandmen, right? And you have that whole dynamic there, but the spirit is also involved in this, okay? If you don't have the Holy Ghost involved, then you're not going to bring forth fruit, okay? And obviously the Holy Ghost has a job when it comes to salvation, right? Meaning that, uh, you know, uh, not according to works which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. N uh, not according to the works. Now I'm going to mess that up. <laughs> I quote this out all the time. Not according to the um, works of righteousness, which we have done. How does it start? Does it start with not? Not, not by, is it? Of not by works of righteousness. There we go. That's it. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us, shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So obviously, for the process of salvation, the Holy Ghost is involved there, right? the renewing of the Holy Ghost, and all that stuff that's going on there, right? But even before that, the Holy Ghost is playing a part, okay? Notice what it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51, it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So notice that this isn't just New Testament, that the Holy Ghost is working and reproving men of sin, right? 
Because the whole point is, is that these people will not admit that they're wrong, right? And the first step to getting saved is admitting you're a sinner, right? Admitting that for the wages of sin is death. And, you know, the, that the fact that uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. That every mouth may be stopped and they may become guilty before God. That's the first step for someone to get saved right there. And the Holy Ghost is involved in that. And he's basically stating here that you're resisting the Holy Ghost. And as your fathers did, so do ye. So he's basically saying your fathers did it and you're doing it right now. And so the Holy Ghost obviously has that uh, job there. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Okay. Now, I believe obviously you're dealing with uh, the fact that no one's going to believe, you know, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I believe that the Holy Ghost has to be involved in that, okay? Meaning that, there ha you know, if the Holy Ghost isn't involved, it's not going to happen, okay? And the Holy Ghost is revealing truth to people. The Holy Ghost is, is reproving the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, okay? So the Holy Ghost is in there working, okay? And uh, go to uh, John chapter 16, John chapter 16, or back to John chapter 16. And this isn't a whole sermon, just to go, I could preach a whole sermon about the ministry of the Holy Ghost, okay? Uh, right now, I'm just trying to give you an outline of who the Holy Ghost is, what's his job, you know, the hierarchy of the Holy Ghost, um, how that affects us, you know, what's the relationship. Because really what we're dealing with here is the Godhead. We're dealing with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and we're dealing with uh, specific things that uh, maybe apply to the Father that don't apply to the Son, or apply to the Son that don't apply to the Father, to the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and we see here that the Holy Ghost is really in the world, in the world. And obviously that makes sense, right? Because the Holy Ghost, if the Holy Ghost is dwelling in us, then obviously the Holy Ghost is down here with us and working with us and all that. Now, in John chapter 16 and verse 13, John chapter 16 and verse 13, let's see the hierarchy again of the Son to the Holy Ghost, okay? Verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, this is not saying that he's not going to talk about himself, <laughs> okay? Because this whole chapter is talking about him, right? So that wouldn't make sense, right? It's talking about he's not gonna, it's not going to come from him, right? And we already saw this with Jesus, right? It says, the words that I speak are not my own, but that which the Father give, gave me, right? And so Jesus is saying that, and Jesus is the Word of God. <laughs> so it's showing you the, the, the perfect unity of the Godhead and the fact that the Holy Ghost only speaks that which the Son gives him, and then the Son only speaks that which the Father gives him, but it's all in unity, Okay. And so this, all, this shows you, you know, the Holy Ghost told me this, the Holy Ghost said that, not unless it's in the Bible, not unless it's out of the mouth of, you know, the Word of God, because that would be speaking of himself, okay? Now, and really what it shows you is that he's not going to speak out of turn. Really, he's speaking that which the Son is telling him to speak, okay? He's in uh, submission to the Son. I can't believe you'd say that. The Son submits himself unto the Father in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that's how it works. You have the Holy Ghost that submits unto the Son and the Son that submits unto the Father. In turn, obviously, the Holy Ghost would be submitted unto the Father. Okay, does that make sense? So, so both the Holy Ghost and the Son are submitted unto the Father. But it's really kind of, if you were going to go down the line of authority, you know, the Holy Ghost is at the end, and Jesus, you know, the Son of God is in the middle, and obviously the Father has ultimate authority. Okay. And you say, I can't believe you're saying that. I'm not saying, this is what the Bible teaches, okay? We believe the Trinity. We don't believe in this uh, non-Trinitarian, uh, modalistic God, like either the, the Islam teaches 
or what, you know, what these one this Pentecostals teach. No, we believe in the Trinity. That means three separate persons, one God, three separate wills, one God, and a hierarchy of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I'm not just making it up. I'm not just saying that because that's the tradition. That's what the Catholic Church t taught. You know what? A blind squirrel finds another every once in a while. But the Bible teaches this, right? Do you not clearly see that the Holy Ghost says, I'm not speaking of myself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice in verse 14, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Sound familiar? No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. And how many times did Jesus say, I, I will glorify thy name, Father, right? And it's saying that the Holy Ghost is going to glorify who? The Son. Jesus is speaking, saying he's going to glorify me. He's going to show, uh, it says, he shall receive a mind. So he's going to receive of Jesus, and he will show it unto you. What did Jesus do? He received of the Father, and he showed it unto us, right? Same type of uh, you know, system of working there. Verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So he's basically saying, everything that the Father has is mine, right? And then I'm going to take all that and I'm going to give it to the Holy Ghost and he's going to show it to you, <laughs> right? But there's this perfect unity. And you say, well, what if the Holy Ghost didn't do what the Son wanted? It's not going to happen, right? It's just as much as saying, well, what if the Son didn't do what the Father wanted? Not going to happen. You know what the difference is? He's God, and he's not sinful, right? He can't break that unity. And, you know, praise God for who he is and his being. And you may not comprehend that, and to you it's like, well, everything messes up. Not God. And you know what that shows is that you have a perfect trinity of free will within the trinity, but no sin, and ultimately, ultimate subjection, you know, to the Father. And it's just a beautiful thing to really see when you see how all that works and how that's never going to be broken. Okay. Now, go to uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. So you say, well, man, you know, when you think of God, the Holy Ghost is kind of getting the tail end of the deal, you know, because he's got, like, the least amount of authority. Okay, because if you think about it, right, the Father's kind of ultimate authority. Jesus, you know, obviously is underneath the Father, but he's also getting a lot of praise because of, you know, what he did on the cross. And, just, you know, obviously everybody talks about Jesus and, and all that. And the Holy Ghost is, is pretty much, if you were to look at it, like a servant to the Son as far as how he's doing everything in the Godhead, right? But I want you to see the defense that the Son gives to the Holy Ghost, okay? Because the Holy Ghost is... Obviously, they're all equal value. I hope you understand this, right? I'm not saying, like, the, the Holy Ghost is of less value than the Son or the Father, okay? But obviously, the roles are different, okay? And the hierarchy of authority goes Father, Son, Holy Ghost, okay? But the Holy Ghost is, is on the, the bottom of that hierarchy. But notice the defense that Jesus gives to the Holy Ghost, okay? You don't mess with the Holy Ghost, okay? It's what it really comes down to. Notice what it says in verse 31. It says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. That's intense. Now notice what he says here. Notice in verse 32. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's intense. He's basically saying, you can say whatever you want about me. You say something against the Holy Ghost, you're done. So notice the love and just the protection or I guess the defense you would look for the Holy Ghost, right? And you can kind of think about this and, and don't, don't put this together too closely, okay? Because obviously I'm not saying like this is a relationship between like husband and wife, right? But you have a hierarchy in husband and wife, right? And you can imagine that it'd be like, you can say whatever you want to say about me, but you say something about my wife, you're done. It's the, kind of like that same kind of mentality, meaning that you can say whatever you want to say about me, but if you talk bad about my wife, we're going to throw hands, <laughs> right? And uh, I'm going to do it in an alley so no one sees me because I'm the pastor. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not going to do that, okay? But the, the, the idea there is that the idea that you have, um, you know, the, the lesser authority, but the servant to the son, you know, as far as the Godhead goes, but the protection that he puts on, on the Holy Ghost and the, uh, the defense he has for the Holy Ghost, that's intense, right? To basically say, you say something against the Holy Ghost, you're not having forgiveness in this world, neither in the world to come. You can say whatever you want to say about me, but don't say anything about the Holy Ghost. And what did they say? Well, go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, it actually specifically says what they said to where he said you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And blasphemy just means to speak against or to rail, if you will, to speak evil of, right? So, and it, it really just says that, right? To speak against the Holy Ghost, to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, right? Um, that's what you're dealing with with blasphemy. But it's going to specifically say here what that means. Notice in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that blaspheme, he, he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. So you're like, well, what does that mean from in this world or the world to come? Never. Never forgiveness. Okay? It says, but is in danger of eternal damnation because, notice that that sentence isn't done, because they said he had an unclean spirit. You remember what this story is talking about, right? Where it says that you are casting out devils by the prince of the devils. They're literally stating that the Holy Ghost, the spirit in which you're casting these devils out is the devil himself, Satan. They called the Holy Ghost Satan, called him the devil, called him Beelzebub, okay? And Jesus said, never forgiven for that. So it's interesting that, that relationship of the Son to the Holy Ghost, right? And I think that's a very interesting picture there. And you can imagine the father-son relationship, right? As far as the father, how the father feels about people, you know, say, because it says, you know, if, uh, if you deny the son, you deny the father, right? That relationship of, you know, you can't have, you can't love the father and not love the son, right? <laughs> because, you know, it's just not going to work out. Uh, but the same thing with the Holy Ghost here is that you, you rail on the Holy Ghost, the son's done with you, okay? And... That's a serious thing, and that's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. But I just want you to see that, you know, because you say, well, um, but again, there's perfect unity as far as the power structure of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the hierarchy, but also the fact that the Holy Ghost, there is a huge defense for the Holy Ghost. Like, you don't talk bad about the Holy Ghost. You do not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. If you do, you're done. Now, obviously, a believer can't do that, uh, can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I kind of already talked about this, but the Bible talks about in the New Testament that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you and that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says, Ye know that ye are the temple, or it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So, obviously, we can't blaspheme in the Holy Ghost, but we can defile the temple in which the Holy Ghost is living in, right? And that temple is your body, okay? Does that make sense? Your body, go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just to show you that it plainly states that. Um, so, we can't blaspheme in the Holy Ghost, but we can get punished to the point of being put to death. And you say, well, when does that ever happen? Ananias and Sapphira? Right? You lied to the Holy Ghost, it even says. Um, but then it's, it talks about, um, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where uh, some of you are sick and some sleep, right? Because you, you're eating the, the Lord's Supper unworthily. You know, it basically it's talking about the fact that they were coming and eating their dinner. They were taking the Lord's Supper as their dinner, um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? So your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, we can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but we can grieve the Holy Ghost. Okay? So in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And what, what is that, the day of redemption? The, the, to wit, the redemption of our body. Okay? And it talks about in other places, it talks about the earnest of the Spirit. Right? It's like the, if you will, the down payment. You know, it's, it's the, uh, the spirit of adoption you know, that we have living inside of us. You know, he's renewed our spirit and our soul, but we're still waiting for that body to be renewed and to be adopted. And, uh, and so we see here that, yeah, we, we can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but we sure can grieve the Holy Ghost. Okay? And, and so that's something to think about as a believer, that in the New Testament, to whom much is given, much is required. Okay. I believe that New Testament believers are held to, to a higher standard when it comes to sanctification because we have the Holy Ghost literally living inside of us. Okay. In the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost would be with them. It would come upon them, you know, like David, and it would even you know, would, uh, you know, help them to pen down, you know, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Obviously, the Holy Ghost was working uh, with these men in the Old Testament and even before the Old Testament, but in the New Testament... You have the Holy Ghost living in you, okay? That's a big deal. It's a good thing, right? It's obviously something that we would say, man, that's a blessing. They didn't have that back then. But uh, it's also, you know, to whom much is given, much is required because, you know what, now if you sin in that body, then there can be some swift destruction coming. Now, what I want to show you here is something that I believe, and I think that I believe this will help you understand the book of 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 2. But the Holy Ghost is always abiding with us. Okay? And you remember Jesus said that? He says, He shall abide with you forever. Okay? But the Father and Son are not always abiding with us. Okay? This is where you get into abiding in the vine. Okay? Because if He was, then that whole chapter wouldn't make sense in John chapter 15. And some of these other verses I'm going to show you wouldn't make sense either. Okay? What it really comes down to is that your new man... Obviously, God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost are all in that, right? But if you're not walking in it, if you're not abiding in the new man, then you're not abiding in the Father and the Son. Does that make sense? And the Father and Son is not abiding in you. So, obviously, truthfully, in your spirit and your soul, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are in you, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory, all that's true, right? But if you're not walking in the new man, you're not abiding in it, Okay? There's a difference between it being, you know, so I hope this doesn't, I hope this isn't getting too deep, okay? But follow me on this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. Remember how I was preaching about knowing doctrine? Okay, so here's some doctrine for you. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. It says, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in you. In him. Now, when you know the context here, we're talking about the Father and the Son, you know, ex, you know, he that acknowledges the Son, the same hath the Father, and it talks about if you continue in this, you shall continue in the Father and the Son, and then it goes into this, okay? So it's basically stating that the Holy Ghost, this anointing, is abiding in you, and if you, it says, and even as he hath taught you, you shall abide in him, and I believe you're talking about the Son or the, the Father here, okay? And I'll, I'll explain that because go to verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. Chapter 3 and verse 6. And if you get this, I think you'll, I think you'll find that 1 John's not that complicated. Okay? Because you're going to see some verses here that you're going to be like, what is that talking about? Okay. Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Okay. So... It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, it starts off the chapter saying, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And then it gets into the fact that, and he was manifested the way to take away our sins. Right? Talking about the Son. So you're, you're, the subject is the Father and the Son at this point, right? And it says that, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, if you understand this, that it says later on, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Your inner man is sinless. Okay? That means that if you're abiding in the new man, you're not sinning. 
Okay? And if you're sinning, you're not abiding in a new man. It's really that simple. Okay? If you're sinning, you're in the flesh. And the flesh hath not seen God, neither known him. Okay? Does that make sense? So, that means that if you're walking in the new man, you're abiding in him. Okay? You're abiding in Jesus. You're abiding in the vine. And if you're abiding in the vine, Jesus and, and the Father are one, right? They're, they're, they're abiding together, right? The Father's in the Son, the Son's in the Father, right? So if you're walking in a new man, you're abiding in Christ, and Christ is abiding in you, okay? And go on to verse 15. Verse 15. So I'm trying to explain these verses, but I want you to know here, the Holy Ghost is always abiding with you, okay? Here's the distinction. The Holy Ghost is always abiding with you. That's why it's such a, a serious charge when it says your, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? Meaning that the Holy Ghost doesn't just leave. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? Obviously, the Holy Ghost is in the new man, right? But it's living in the body, okay? It's abiding with you, okay? Now, uh, in verse uh, 15 here, it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. I don't know how many times I've had people say, what is that talking about? <laughs> okay, because obviously we know that, you know, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, this verse is clearly talking about the eternal life being Jesus. Okay, it starts off the book saying that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon our hands of handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. And how does the book end? This is the true God and eternal life. Okay? So who are we talking about? Jesus. Starts off saying that Jesus is eternal life, ends with Jesus being eternal life, and in the middle it's stating that if you hate your brother, then you're considered a murderer, right? Because if, you hate, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you've committed a murder already in your heart, right? But if you hate your brother, you should never hate your brother, but if you hate your brother, it's constituting you as a murderer, and it's saying eternal life's not abiding in you, okay? Why? Because you're walking in the flesh. That means that if you hate your brother, you are not walking in the spirit. You're not walking in the new man. And to say so would be to be a liar, okay? That's what it keeps saying throughout the book of 1 John. So that means that the eternal life's not always abiding in you, meaning Jesus is not always abiding in you because you're not walking in the new man. And so... I, don't lose me here because I'm not saying you lose everlasting life or you lose Jesus, okay? Your new man never loses Jesus. That eternal life's always abiding in the new man, okay? Jesus is always there. But if you're not walking in the new man, you're not abiding in it, okay? If you choose to walk in the flesh, you're not abiding in the new man. Does that make sense? And if, we're, if the new man is where Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Ghost are, are, are there, right, then you're not abiding in the Father and the Son there. Okay, so that's why it's saying that, hey, if you sin, you're not abiding in him. And if you hate your brother, you're not, he's not abiding in you. That means Jesus is not making his abode with you, you know, holistically when you're sinning or when you're hating your brother. Okay, now go to verse 24, verse 24. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you want to know the distinction between the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost never, like, is always abiding with you, okay? Holistically is always with you. You know what that means, though? You can grieve the Holy Ghost, okay? So there is a, there is a if you want to say that's an upside, obviously, the downside is you can grieve the Holy Ghost because if you sin in the body, like fornication, every sin is without the body of fornication, you sin against your own body, and the whole point of why he's saying this is because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, so you're sinning and defiling the home of the Holy Ghost, if you will, the body, okay? Now, so in, uh, in 1 John chapter 3, and verse 24, notice what it says. It says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Notice this. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Okay? You know this other verse where it says, uh, the Spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Whosoever is led of the Spirit, the same are the children of God. This is all going into that aspect that if you're walking in the Spirit, then you're walking in the new man. 
You're walking as a child of God. But your flesh is not a child of God. Your flesh has not seen God. Your flesh has not been regenerated. Your flesh is still a child of wrath and disobedience, right? So that's why there's this stark contrast in here. It's like, okay, it's like it's either like you're completely sinless or you're sinless or you're completely sinful. <laughs> okay? That's because the flesh, in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. But in a new man, it can't commit sin. Okay? So there's this stark contrast here. But the Holy Ghost is the one bearing witness, are you walking in the Spirit or not? Are you abiding in Jesus or not? And the Spirit is bearing witness because the Spirit's always with us. Okay? And the Spirit's basically uh, showing us, hey, you know, here's how you know if you're abiding in Him because the Spirit is going to declare it. Okay? Now, uh, go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. So I hope I don't lose you on this point where you're just like, what are you talking about? But when you're looking at 1 John, if you understand that the Spirit's always abiding there, and the Spirit never leaves, never, like, never is not abiding, then you understand that what it's stating in these verses is that the Spirit is telling you whether you're really abiding in Christ or not. And if you're sinning, you're not abiding in Christ. Okay? That's essentially, if you're not keeping His commandments, that means you're sinning. And, but if you're keeping your commandments, you're abiding in Him, and the Spirit is showing you that you're abiding in Him because you're keeping His commandments, because the Spirit's always with you. Okay? Because the Spirit is living in your body. Okay? Now, in verse uh, 12 there, so 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, No man has seen God at any time. Who are we talking about? The Father. Right? We're talking about the Father. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So who's the God that's dwelling in us in this verse right here? The Father. It says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. So notice that the spirit is how we know whether the Father is dwelling in us or how the Son is abiding in us. Right? Chapter 3 is more so talking about the Son. Chapter 4 is talking about God the Father. And then it goes on to say the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And it goes, it, that, chapter 4 is really talking about how the Father sent the Son, hereby perceive we the love of God because he sent his only begotten Son, going through that whole thing, right? But go, go back to John chapter uh, 14, John chapter 14. So, I just want these verses to make sense to you because when you look at this, the Father and the Son uh, making their abode or abiding with us is not automatic as a Christian, okay? Does that make sense? It's not automatic. It doesn't mean that, spiritually speaking, he's not there, okay? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Father's in us, the Holy Ghost is in us. The new man, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are always there, okay? But if you're not walking in the new man, you know, you kind of look at the new man over here, the old man right here. If you're walking in this old man right here, and you're abiding in this old man, you see how the Father and the Son are over here? Okay? But the Holy Ghost is pretty much the intercessor to as far as the Father and the Son abiding with us, or we abiding with them. Okay? Because I, I look at the Father and Son, you know, like him abiding with us is the same as him, uh, we, uh, we're abiding in him, right? It's kind of like the Father's in me and I in the Father, right? It's one and the same kind of uh, definition there. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So what's the premise here? Keeping his commandments. The book of 1 John is all about that. As far as keeping his commandments, doing those things which are pleasing in his sight. And the whole point is what? That your joy may be full. Okay? The idea here is that... Uh, and, and I know, you know, the trust and obey, we were talking about the trust and obey song and how we're like, you know, I'm kind of like torn with that because I've heard repentance people like, you know, use that song wrongfully. But the only way to be happy in Jesus and for Jesus to abide with you is to trust and obey. Okay. And so that truly could apply dealing with obeying what he says to do and all that. Okay. Now, if you want to apply it just to salvation, well, obey the gospel. <laughs> okay. So, but that being said, uh, we see here that if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, that he may abide with you forever. Now, obviously we're talking about the Holy Ghost coming. At this point, he hasn't come yet, okay? He has not come yet. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it 
seeth him, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, and ye, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So this is something that's going to happen in the future. Obviously, it's already happened to us. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye, sh ye see me, because I live, and ye shall, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. So are we talking about it, salvation here? No, okay? Because that would just contradict everything else in the book of John, right? It says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Why? Because if you love me, keep my commandments, right? And it says, and he that loveth me shall, love my, shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So this is something that is up and above and beyond being saved, okay? So we're talking about something that's above that or beyond that, okay? And it says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. I love how it says that. It's like Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. <laughs> Just so you know, we're not talking about that guy. <laughs> so, uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Notice this, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make, or I'm sorry, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Okay? So abode, abide, you know, it's just a different tense of the word. Okay? What it's stating here is that if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, keep my word, I and my Father, we will come unto you and make our abode with you. That's what 1 John's talking about. But see how the Spirit is always there? The Spirit is always there with you. The Holy Ghost is living in your body. <laughs> okay? I take that literally. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body. Okay? The new man right now is the spirit and the soul, not the body. Okay? One day it will be. One day the body will be the new man too, but we're not yet. But right now, the Holy Ghost is living in your body, okay? Holistically, the Holy Ghost is there, okay? If you love God, if you, if you love Jesus, that means you're going to keep his commandments. And if you're keeping his commandments, the Father and the Son are going to come and make their abode with you, okay? You want another verse on this? Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I don't know if I'm going to get to my last point, but we'll see. <laughs> last point is kind of a bonus anyway, so... Um, I know this is deep, but you, you say, what's the distinction between the, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, okay? Well, the big distinction I see with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament here is the fact that the Holy Ghost is literally always abiding with us, okay? Now, spiritually speaking, obviously the Father and the Son are always there, okay? But if we're not abiding in that, then we're not always abiding in the Father and the Son, okay? But... We can't get away from the Spirit. Now, whether you want to take that as good or bad, that depends on how you live, right? Because if you defile the, the temple of God, then that's a bad thing. But if, you, if you're trying to live for Christ, just know the Holy Ghost is always abiding with you. Okay? And, and here's the thing. If you're abiding, if you're abiding in, uh, if you're walking in the Spirit, guess what? The Father and the Son are there too. Okay? There is a distinction. Okay, so this idea of like, you know, that it's all one person. How do you answer those verses where it's talking about the fact that you'll know that the Father or the Son is abiding in you by the Spirit which you have given us, right? The Spirit is telling us that they are abiding with us or we're abiding in them. And it's always based on the fact of are you sinning? Are you keeping the commandments? Are you hating your brother, right? And it's really simple. If you do what he tells you to do, you're abiding in him, Okay. That's simple. But if you're breaking his commandments, you're not abiding in him, and he's not abiding in you. And except you abide in the vine, you, shall, you, you can do nothing, right? You can't bear fruit if you're not abiding in the vine. So that means if, uh, was it Brother Dave that won somebody today uh, out soul winning? Guess what? The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, you were abiding in the Father and the Son, and the Son was, and the Father was abiding in you. Simple, right? But, you know, if David were to, you know, disobey his parents and, you know, in the moment that he's, like, not honoring his father and mother, and I'm not, I don't mean to, like, pull you into, like, 
you thought I was just going to talk good about you, right? <laughs> but if he was just going to dishonor his father and mother, you see how the father and son's not abiding in that, okay? But what's he doing? He's grieving the Holy Ghost, okay? Now, Romans, uh, Romans, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19 now, he just got done talking and rebuking and, and basically exhorting and rebuking these, these seven churches um, in Revelation 2 and 3. Notice in verse 19, as many as I love, notice this, who's talking? Jesus, right? Jesus is talking to these seven churches. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. So is he talking to unbelievers or is he talking to the saved people, right? Because the Lord loveth whom he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, Right? And if, if you don't receive chastisement, then are you bastards and not sons? So the idea of him chastening bastards would be weird, okay? And that's just not what the Bible teaches. Notice in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Sound familiar? Sounds like he's going to make his abode with you. If what? If you repent. Okay? So here's Jesus saying, hey, listen... I'm standing at the door, right? It's not that he's not there, right? But if you want him to make his abode with you, right? Coming into your house, right? If, if someone, would you say that if someone's like outside your house knocking that you're like, he's making his abode with me right now. He's abiding with me right now. No, it's not until you let him into the house, okay? And so, but these people are already saved, okay? So if they don't open the door, they're still saved, okay? But they're getting chastened. And he's, he's rebuking them, and he's saying, you need to repent, okay? And the same thing would apply to a Christian that's living in sin, not abiding in the new man, which means they're not abiding in the Father and the Son, and they're grieving the Holy Ghost, okay? Does that make sense? I, ho I hope that makes sense. I hope that's very crystal clear, okay? That in the new man, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in them, the seed remaineth in them, the Father's in them, you know, God will not leave thee nor forsake thee, right, in the spirit and the soul. But bodily, right, the Holy Ghost is there always. Now, if you're walking in a new man, guess what? The Father and Son is there with you in the body as well, okay? So that's what I believe on that. And if you have a different interpretation of that, that's fine. I, that's just what I believe, and I believe that that shows you a, a great distinction uh, between the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost as far as uh, the relationship with us, if anything, with that. Now, um, all right, let's go through this real quick. Okay, so go to uh, go to Acts chapter two. So uh, there's something Brother Dave and I were talking about with the Holy Ghost, and you think about the Holy Ghost. What do you usually think about? You think about the day of Pentecost, right? And you think about being baptized with the Holy Ghost and the great. Uh, gifts of the Spirit and like all these different things that people were doing miraculous things, right? Well, um, obviously we know that to be true that that happened at the day of Pentecost, but I believe this mirrors into uh, what will happen in the end times, okay? Um, and go to uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. So Peter's standing up and he's going to start preaching. And it says in verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's going to basically state that Joel prophesied about this. Now he's going he's to preach what he said. Verse 17, And shall come to pass in the last days. Okay? So that means that in the day of Pentecost, that was considered the last days, okay? I want, I want that to just kind of ring through that. It was the last days during that time, and it's still the last days. Now, it says, uh, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Now, in Joel, you don't have to turn there, but in Joel, the last portion there, it says, whosoever shall call, call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
It says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Zion, Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, what I want to say here is that I believe this mirrors what's going to happen in the end. Because notice that when it talks about vapor of smoke, pillars of smoke, you know, it says in Joel, um, the sun and moon being darkened. Did that happen at the day of Pentecost? No. So that wasn't completely fulfilled. Okay. Now, you can probably think off the top of your head something else that wasn't completely fulfilled. Um, but first, I want to state this. Then in Joel, it says, they shall be delivered and there shall be deliverance in Jerusalem. And notice the terminology it says in Daniel. You don't have to turn there. I know we're kind of running short on time here. But it talks about there's going to be trouble. You know, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust shall, shall awake. And it's talking about the resurrection. It's talking about the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. So, you can see how this applies, obviously, to his first coming, right? Obviously, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're talking about eternal salvation, preaching the gospel. Obviously, that's what they were doing. The, the Spirit of God was being poured out upon them. But how that mirrors to the end times. Now, go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, because this prophecy, because what I'm trying to state here is that Joel, I believe, is dual, meaning that it's talking about his first coming, but it's definitely talking about his second coming, too. Right? Actually, when you read Joel 2, you're mostly thinking probably about that second coming, right? The sun and moon being darkened, you know, and the fact that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And what we're going to see here is how that mirrors in whosoever shall endure unto the end, shall, the same shall be saved. And the idea of being delivered from what? Physical death. Okay? So in uh, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Sound familiar? Because isn't it what, what it says? It says, The sun and moon shall be darkened before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Right? And it says, And, and he shall turn the, the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So, this clearly you know, Jesus is saying this is being fulfilled with John the Baptist, right? Because in Luke 1, 17, it says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and in disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So it's, it's pulling from that saying, hey, this is being fulfilled here. But guess what? There is an ultimate fulfillment of that passage, okay? Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, meaning... Elijah, the prophet, the man himself, is going to come before the great and notable day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Does that make sense? Like, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he's fulfilling that scripture, you know, in part there. But the ultimate fulfillment of that scripture is when Elijah, the man himself, is coming. Okay? And I, I, I think people will say, well, is it Moses and Elijah, or is it Elijah and Enoch? I don't think anybody disputes that it's Elijah. I'm sure there's somebody, okay? But I would say most everybody says that Elijah's one of them, okay? And in verse, 11, or verse 3, so Revelation chapter 3, 11, verse 3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now go down to verse 6, because there's going to be these two men that are going to prophesy for three and a half years, okay? 1260 days, three and a half. Three and a half years, 42 months, however you want to say it. Notice in verse 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not. Notice this, in the days of their prophecy. You know what that's saying? Is that they prophesied in days past, right? In the days of their prophecy, they had power to shut heaven that it rain not. And even in James chapter 5, it says that Elijah prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained for how long? Three and a half years. Three years, six months. You know what that is? 1260 days, right? 1260 days, 42 months, a time times and half a time. So if you know when this happens, you know when this happens? At the abomination and desolation. When, you know, the, the court's being trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, that's when that starts. You know when that is? Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That Elijah the prophet's going to come. The man himself, right? In the days of his prophecy. We're, talking, we're not talking about John the Baptist. 
We're not talking about somebody being born and being in the spirit and power of Elijah. We're talking about Elijah the man. Okay? So that being said, when you're dealing with Joel, and it's saying that the spirit of God is going to be poured out upon them, and that basically there's going to be all these wonders, I believe, and listen, I could be wrong on this, okay? I believe that just as much as there was all the spiritual power that was being done with God's people at the day of Pentecost, how much more will it be done in the end times? I mean, think about all the things that have happened in the Bible, right? All the events that have happened in the Bible. Would there not be a more, you know, needed spot where the Holy Ghost is working with God's people than at that time? When we're being, like, mowed down and trying, people are trying to kill us and we're trying to preach the gospel to every creature, you know, before the end, okay? Now, to give you some proof on that, and I know I'm kind of running late here, but I, I just want to put this out here. Okay, go to, go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. So there's that. There's the mirroring of Joel 2. No one would question that part of that uh, information that, that Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter was preaching there has not happened yet, right? Except for preterists. <laughs> I guess preterists would be like, well, I guess the sun and moon was darkened, and, you know, like that actually happened back then. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that happened. It didn't say that it happened on the day of Pentecost. It just talked about people being filled with the Spirit, you know, being baptized with the Holy Ghost, if you will, and them preaching the gospel and getting people saved, okay? That definitely happened. But I believe that's also going to happen in a special way, if you will, a special outpouring, if you will, during the end time. And notice in Luke 21, verse 10. Luke 21, verse 10, it says, And then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Okay? So, sounds familiar to the beginning of sorrows. You see a lot of this stuff, right? That it's repeated in Mark 13, Matthew 24, right? But notice in verse 12 here. But before all these. Okay? So, what he's about to say happens way before the beginning of sorrows, before any of that stuff, right? So, I believe he's specifically talking about the people that he's literally talking to, the disciples he's talking to at that time. It says, there shall, shall they lay hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adver adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Now what I'm about to get to is the fact that when it's talking about this, it's talking about the Holy Ghost is basically going to tell you, you know, basically not tell, I don't want to say that like audibly tell you, but basically he's going to give you a mouth or give you what to say, okay? And it says, and you shall be betrayed both the parents and brethren and kinsfolks and brethren, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish, and your patience possess ye your souls. So if you understand that, obviously the apostles did some, there were some miraculous things that happened, right? You think of Peter, um, you know, the, the jail being bust open and all this stuff that happened back then, right? And what I'm trying to get to is that I believe this could very well happen. If we were in the end times and we were about to come to that last period of time as far as uh, the Great Tribulation, that this same type of stuff could happen to us as Christians, okay? Meaning like jailhouses could break open, they could try to kill us, but it won't happen. You know, just a lot of stuff that could happen in our time that in the Holy Ghost, meaning that there's this, where obviously you can be filled with the Holy Ghost right now, and the Holy Ghost is living in you. But there is a difference between being filled with the Holy Ghost right now and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, right? And that special outpouring where people were like literally speaking in another language to people, okay? And this is just a theory, okay? So don't, don't be like, oh, Pastor Robinson is like, dead sure that's going to happen, okay? I'm just telling you that I, I've, I see that maybe being a dual fulfillment where you had the day of Pentecost starting off the New Testament, and then at the end of the world, you had that same thing happening with God's people. Um, just like Joel was kind of partially stated and happened, but the next part hasn't happened yet, and the, the parallel of John the Baptist with Elijah and all that. Now, Mark chapter 13, go to Mark chapter 13, because Luke 21, all that stuff I stated there from verse 12 in Luke 21 to verse 19 it says, before all these things, right? 
So it's talking about you being brought up to synagogues, all this stuff. Okay, well, Mark 13, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say before all these things. It's basically saying this will happen to you, okay? So now in Mark 13, you're dealing, I believe you're dealing with what's going to happen in the end, okay? So if you think about back in their day when they were the apostles and they were confirming the word of God with signs following, but, you know, you also had the end of the last days. So you kind of had the beginning of the start of the last days with the day of Pentecost, then you had the end of the last days, if you will. Now, pardon my terminology there. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but if you were to look at it that way. Mark 13, verse 8, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. So we know that that's the first three and a half years of that, that week right there, is that stuff right there. That's the first four seals, if you will. And then you, you have verse 9, it says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and then synagogues, and ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever ye shall be given, what shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. So, now, I want to say this. The Holy Ghost isn't going to pull something out of you don't have. Does that make sense? Like, I talked about this this morning, meaning that you need to have Bible memorized. You need to have, because the Holy Ghost won't speak of himself, okay? He's not just going to have you speaking something that's not in the Bible, okay? But what I believe is that God it talks about he's going to give you what to say in that hour. No one's going to be able to resist it, okay? And what I believe that's going to be is this special uh, filling of the Spirit, if you will, to where your mind is unlocked to where you're just like, this is exactly what needs to be said. This, the wisdom of the Holy Ghost and God and his word will just be unlocked at that moment. Now, I can't prove that besides the fact that it says it, you know what I mean, right? But to me, Mark 13 clearly is talking about end times, okay? And so don't take it too far. Don't take it to the point where the Holy Ghost is audibly talking to you in your ear, like, hey, Jason, say this. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that I believe that there's going to be, like the, the apostles that stood up and just said, we ought to obey God rather than men, you know, that what to say, the words to say as far as like God's word is going to be just put into your mind as far as bringing back to remembrance all those things. And no one's going to be able to gainsay it nor resist it. So I think that's interesting as far as the Holy Ghost goes, as far as how that, that could affect us in the future. Um, but, and, and you say, you say what, do you, what do you really mean by that? I believe it's magnified, right? This happens to us now, right? You go out soul winning and, and you're thinking, you know, a verse will pop into your mind. But I believe that this will be magnified to the nth degree, okay? That the Holy Ghost is upon you so much that it's going to be like Stephen. You know, they're going to behold, behold your face as if you're an angel, you know? Like, that's how magnified it will be. Like, they won't be able to gainsay what you're... I mean, all the stuff that you've ever read in the Bible and everything that you've ever memorized will come to mind. And not only that, but you'll know how to discern it. Like, just, just a, kind of a, just opening up your mind. The Holy Ghost is just using you as much as he can. Okay? And I believe the Bible's teaching that. Okay? They did it with the apostles. I believe he could do it again in the end times. And that's where the Holy Ghost is stepping in. You know, and so it's a beautiful thing, obviously, to see that. I know it went way too far with the sermon, <laughs> way too long. But uh, just some exciting stuff, and maybe I should have done that in two sermons. But let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and thank you for the soul that was saved today. And just pray that you be with us throughout the rest of this week. And Lord, uh, we just uh, love you for everything that you've done for us. And we thank you for your teachings of the Trinity, the Godhead, and Lord, just uh, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that hierarchy. and just showing us all that information about who you are and, and just how beautifully that works together. And Lord, we love you. I pray us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.